this is Emily in Los Angeles. Hi, this is Dean in North Carolina. And this is Caleb in Springfield, Missouri. And welcome to Hack a Week Coast to Coast, Episode 8. Awesome. He gets the uh, octadecimal episode. How lucky. Nice. That was a very, very good intro. Um, <laughs> yes. um, well, thank you for joining us today. Like, it's a real pleasure. Um, super excited to have you on. Um, and uh, I, I hope our, our viewers will be as well, because um, you're pretty freaking rad. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you. Exciting. So, um, Dean, you want to get started here? What, you had some questions, right? Yeah. Um, you know, like we usually ask um, people when they're on the show, and it, it, they always come down to the same thing. Most people are like maker, doer, crafter, builder type people. And I think we all share a common theme of where we started out. There was something at some point in your life that you decided to either take apart or you were curious about or whatever. And uh, so what was that What was that first thing for you? The first thing you decided you wanted to open up and see what the little bits inside did. And how did that go? <laughs> oh, geez. You know, I can't, there's a few that stand out. Uh, I can't remember what the first was. I remember what the first elect electronics project I built was, but I, I can't remember what the first thing I took apart was. You know, I had, I had older siblings. Uh, seven and eight years older than me, so I'm sure that that there were there were things being taken apart in my presence as you know far back as I can remember. Um, Did your siblings share an interest in like making and doing stuff? Were they also into that kind of thing? They were inquisitive for okay. sure. Um, I don't, not the same degree of enjoying the creation process necessarily, but I think they wanted to know how things worked. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, so they certainly disassembled things a lot. Yeah. So what was your first electronics project? It was a light organ. I was in fourth grade and my parents put me in a, uh, like a summer school class for electronics. And it was just an analog light organ. Um, and I barely remember, I mean, I don't know how well you guys remember fourth grade, I barely remember anything other than sitting there and thinking it was so cool seeing this. I think we used like outdoor lights, like multicolor outdoor lights mm -hmm. and just, just being blown away by seeing them light up whenever you'd talk, you know, into the little microphone. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I didn't understand how the circuit worked, but I learned how to solder and I learned, you know, the way to follow the, the schematic and stuff like that at least. That's awesome. That's cool. I think my, so I think my first electronics project was um, when I did with my dad and I was probably in third or fourth grade and we built a, like a telegraph. It was just like a one way telegraph. So you tap the little, like whatever, the little clicky thing. And then on the other end, the telegraph would click. Um, but the first one I did on my own was something I got out of one of those, you know, those um, Forrest Mims, like mini engineer notebooks they had at Radio Shack. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got one of those from Radio Shack, and I decided I was going to build this thing that, like, you could. It had a little, like, a little uh, photo sensor on it, and it was supposed to convert light into sound. And I tried to build one of these things, and it was a complete disaster. Like, it didn't work at all. Um, I think Dean has seen a photo. Someone on Twitter said it looked like uh, Bobby the Robot uh, jizzed all over my circuit board. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was my first project, and I still have it, which is kind of fun. Ah, that's funny. That's actually cool that you kept that. <clears throat> yeah, it's in my stash. I'll probably hang on to it for forever. I mentioned my first one in that talk I gave, and it, it, I did the short version of it. I built a crystal radio, and instead of a cat's whisker, which was a fine wire, I used my real cat's whisker. I cut a whisker <laughs> off my cat. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it said cat's whisker, you know. Yeah, yeah. I doubt that worked very well, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't work. Pissed off the cat, too. So. <laughs> did, did either of you guys have that that kit? I don't remember who made it, but it was like a, a plastic shell with a cardboard top, and it had, like, kind of springs, yeah. and you could, like, make yeah. radios and stuff. Might on it. Radio Shack did one. They did quite a few. Yeah, I had one of those at some point. I don't. I don't remember how old I was, but I remember those playing cool. around. There's yeah. so many engineers out there that have started out with one of those. And um, yeah, it was like the like the stories. Archer Archer 100 projects in one or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, I totally had one of those. That I, I never, I think I built the little like, it was like a little radio you could build. It, it came with like the little bar with the wire wrapped around it. Uh-huh. I think I made that. And I don't think I ever made anything else that worked on that thing. Like lose all the pieces and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I mean, there's people still doing those kind of things too, which I think is neat. There's a bit of a revival of that, you know, how to learn about electronics with really simple things. Um, even right down to just paper and paper clips. There's a few people have done projects like that where they do stuff with, you know, kids on little meetups that they have in libraries and whatnot. My wife does some of that kind of stuff. So I let her know about a bit of that. Yeah. One of the members of our, like our weekly maker hacker group, she does that. Um, she does like childhood education in electronics and they just use the copper tape. So they like lay out the copper tape to make the, the traces and then like stick LEDs and things to it. And the kids have a blast. They, they really enjoy that stuff. Yeah, it's like, you know, instant results. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so Caleb, what, um, what inspired you? Like what, like what took you from like maybe just kind of like poking around like in that class and, and doing that little project? Like what inspired you to take things and like make a hobby out of it? Oh boy. Uh, I don't know when it, transition really happened i mean i've always kind of had a fascination with um people being passionate about something and and skilled at something um and then others coveting that thing right so you know i always i always kind of had a little bit of a fantasy of of you know being an artist or a rock. i mean everybody wants to be a rock star at some point right um but you know my images would be like would be like you know imagining being like the book binder everybody wants to bind their their fancy books or something like that and then uh around the time hackaday and make both kind of appeared at a at a similar time i had already been doing a little bit of stuff as a hobby but never really put any weight into it or or considered it anything more than just you know, junk you do when you're not doing something else. Yeah. And then between those two, mainly at that time, Hackaday, uh, just seeing the things that people were doing um, and the response people had to it really kind of lit a fire under me, you know? Yeah, yeah I think that's, um, you know, I, I think I kind of only stumbled into the maker community like a year and a half, two years ago. And like, it was really surprising to see like how much support and enthusiasm there is from like other makers for people that work on stuff. Right. Cause like I grew up and like I went to school and like I'd work on my projects and my friends would just like brag on me about like, what is this weird thing you're working on? Like, why are you doing these dumb things? Like, why are you making a Tesla coil? Like they, they didn't get it. Right. And then you like stumble into the community and other people are excited about what you're doing. And that's, that's super cool. That's like, I mean, it's, it's empowering, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's that tribe thing, too, we've touched on in past episodes. You know, everybody's got that. Everybody wants to belong to a tribe. And when you find your tribe, it's a very exciting time, you know? It's fun yeah. to feel like you belong. And it makes you flourish with the things you do and all your artistic talents and whatever different forms of create creativity. Right. And not, not just being, like, encouraged, but, like, just – being around that like creative energy other people have and seeing their ideas and seeing their passion and like, and like the cross pollinating of ideas that you get, like that is just one of the best things about like being part of the like quote unquote community is like, just there's so many amazing people out there that just give me such good ideas and just inspire me to like try new things in so many different ways. And it's just great. I love it. It's, it's just, it's, it's, I've been in a lot of like, communities like old VW community and all like and beer brewing communities and like in a lot of communities like people are jerks to be honest but like the maker community like people are just so cool and they're so encouraging and it's it's really it's really heartening to see that they they certainly are in uh in some aspects of the community and then other places you go they can be pretty toxic but but yeah yeah this community is pretty magical for sure it's like uh it's like feeling the warmth by a campfire it's yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's daily too, you know. I mean, it is for me every day on Twitter, you know, and Instagram, YouTube, etc., all of it. There's 
at, at least a couple of times a day where somebody does something and it relates to something you're thinking about or working on. And, you know, it's inspiring. We're all inspiring each other, I think, all the time. The maker community does really lift each other up more than any other community I've been, uh, you know, part of or, or participated in. Uh, right. The, the way we promote each other is pretty incredible. Yeah, that, that's that's actually really true. Now you think I think about it. You mention it. I mean, how many times do you see people do that with each other all the time? They read like, oh, you just today. I just got mentioned on um, Hackaday. Didn't know about it. Emily posted it on Twitter and went, Dean. <laughs> oh, okay. Look at that. I got a, you know, another article going on in Hackaday. So I shared it, and you know, and at the same time, I'm linking to Hackaday. So then they get a hit, and everybody's happy. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. On that note, Caleb, like who are some who are some makers out there right now who inspire you? Who who are your current inspirations? Oh boy. Well, right now this second I am into this engraving thing I've been doing. So I'm kind of watching a lot of engravers and metal workers. Um which is a double-edged sword of course because some of them are so good. That you know, you you look at your own stuff and you go, oh, oh, why bother, right? Like I'm never gonna get there. Uh, but um, there's a there's a woman, Jenny Bauer Engraving, I think, is her name on Instagram or JB Engraving or something. It's Jenny Bauer, I think. Um, Hazel Hand Engraving, uh, just just a whole slew of engravers are, are people I'm watching right now. But in general, I, you know, there's, there's people that are, that are really inspiring because they do things that like, I see it and I get it instantly and I feel like I could have made it, but I never would have thought of it. Mm -hmm. So like, like, um, well, for example, like Mohit Boyd's circuit sculptures, they're not brand new, it's not a new concept. He's not like treading new ground, but the way he thought about them and constructed them was just beautiful. I mean, like that was a real inspiration to me. Your, your selfie CRT was just incredible. <laughs> that thing was beautiful. Cool. And, and that's, I find that inspirational to be able to see, especially when people are doing things that are kind of like the materials aren't necessarily a new or unattainable thing, but just some twist on it that I, you know, that, I couldn't have, thought, or, you know, didn't think of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've seen a little bit of your engraving online, and I got to say, it looks great. Um, what, can you tell us a little bit about engraving and, and what you're doing and how it works? Sure, sure. What I'm doing is hand engraving using a uh, pneumatic engraver, which is, um, it's a little thing that fits in your hand that, uh, kind of looks like a mushroom on one end and then you get a spiky and gravy bit on the other. And it's got a little piston inside of it so that whenever you put air through it, the piston does the work of a hammer. So it's basically like hammer and chisel engraving, but you can do it with one hand so that then you can grab the piece with your other hand and rotate it. Um, and you're cutting through the metal instead of like, you know, on a, on a, on an, uh, instead of like a laser or or a machine that's like grinding like a dremel this is actually cutting through the metal with a very sharp sharp engraver bit um and i'm really just like drawing doodling having fun i've made a few that i've given away to some people on science twitter uh, yeah. i made a crow skull one that i sent out to uh kaylee swift who is a i hope i said her name right dr kaylee swift uh who studies crows and I just finished one today. That's a bobtail squid that I'm sending to uh, Sarah McNulty, I think on Twitter, Sarah Mac attack, I think is her name. Yeah. And she studies squids and uh, I'm just having fun with it. Yeah. Well, they were both just gorgeous. Um, I got to see a few of them at uh, at maker fair and um, just, they are just, I don't know that it, it, they feel like, something out of another era almost right like it's just it's an art that you don't see a lot in like modern setting well, that was part of the appeal for me because you know i'm 
I'm neck deep in 3D printing and CNC routing and plastic parts and laser cutting, you know, typically plastic parts and, and all of this like perfect machine angles and, and, you know, all of this stuff. And it's, it's great. I love digital fabrication. Um, but that, combined also with the aspect of my career and the aspect of this modern culture where we're see, like constantly seeking clicks and views made me really want something that felt more connected to me as a human being, right? So whenever you look at these engravings, they're imperfect. Yeah. They're imperfect with the trimmers in my hands and they're imperfect with my motions. And for a short while, I was outside of getting clicks and views, but now I'm, of course, I'm taking pretty pictures of them and posting them all over social media. So I'm, yeah. I'm feeding that ego monster again, just like I was before. But you know, at least it's something that feels, you know, it's it's slow and it's imperfect and it's um, it's rewarding. You know, yeah. it feels good to get one done and and look look at it and be and be pleased with it. Yeah, I never well, I never thought about this really, but do you, do you think that like the steampunk subculture do you think that there's some of some of the some of that same appeal there like er, everything these days like our products are so slick and so designed and like steampunk is almost the opposite i mean there's a lot of work that goes into it and there's a lot of like design thought that goes into it but it's like deliberately complex complicated and deliberately complex and almost messy in in its own way do you think that there's that's where some of that appeal comes from well i think that's in general, I think that's what the punk part of it means, right? If you look at cyberpunk or diesel punk or any of those, right? They are the, the real life chaotic manifestation of an aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? So with cyberpunk, it was always, you know, the implants, but they were like a realistic, gruesome kind of stitched together, you know, version. And diesel punk, you know, we get into the, sure, it's a diesel aesthetic, but it's, but it's kind of uh, embracing that kind of, imperfection of real life and so yeah yeah i think i think that that has a, an appeal to a lot of people you know and and i don't think that any of them are exclusive i don't think that you know you have to define yourself by wanting something that's one way or wanting something that's another but they're just things you can enjoy yeah yeah um, Dean, you had some more questions right i've been talking a while <laughs> <laughs> that's okay um Oh, mistakes. You got to touch on the mistakes thing because we, <laughs> we all make mistakes. And I think you recognize the value of a mistake because hopefully you learn from it. Um, so probably I, I you know, would say sometimes, you know, I say worst mistake, but that's not really a fair way to put it because sometimes that worst mistake can be the best one you made because you really learned a valuable lesson from it. So given that whole statement, pick one and tell us about it and it's yeah it's it's both ends of it you know the mistake you made and what you learned from it and what was the value of that lesson i've got a good one i've got a real good one uh because i have been asked this question before and had to really put some serious thought into it um i don't i don't mind mistakes at all whenever it comes to learning a new skill or constructing something um i actually look forward to it because you know whenever you look at your knowledge of something and you can say this works this way or this doesn't work this way you're either speaking from experience of failures or you're speaking at your ass right <laughs> so as i collect these failures i feel more knowledgeable exactly so those don't bother me but there is one that still when i think about it i get that little that little tinge in the back of my spine that's like ouch you know it makes me cringe and that is the that is um there's a video on Hackaday's channel, the first gaming controller I made for somebody with a physical disability. Um, I made a, uh, a modular control system for a kid named Thomas who has muscular dystrophy. And it's, uh, it was all 3D printed and custom circuits hooked onto a teensy microcontroller because it has USB HID and I didn't have to install any drivers. Um, and it was so he could play Minecraft and I put all this effort into it and I built this thing from scratch and I made this heart wrenching video with, I mean, it was like a Sarah McLaughlin, uh, commercial for you know, something. It was heart wrenching. It's still there. If you go back on the Hackaday channel, you can find it. 
but when I delivered it to this kid, after all the filming was done and I watched him actually, you know, laying his hands on it, it kind of sunk in that this thing was useless. Oh no. Just, oh. just a complete waste of everybody's time. Damn. And it was because, you know, my ego got in the way and I thought, well, I know what problems he's having. I know what I can build to fix those problems. Um, I, I overcomplicated everything because, you know, just modifying a controller wasn't cool enough or whatever. And then I put him, this is the part that I feel the worst about. I put him on camera with sad music Oh yeah. and a sad voiceover, which is in retrospect is absolutely taking advantage of his disability for my game. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he, he, he said he had fun. We got on the local news and he had fun, you know, messing around and having something made for him. But ultimately, I consider that whole experience, that specific one, to have been a failure. I failed him in, in making him a better controller. I failed, I feel, myself uh, morally in taking advantage of his, uh, his uh, physical disability for my gain in such a way that feels gross in retrospect but it did spur me to do the controller project which is on hold right now but generally what i do is i i build controllers for people with physical disabilities i do it for free and um i promote it in ways that i feel are are ethically uh more tasteful um and so i mean there was a lot of good that came out of it but but that one instance was a pretty striking failure in my opinion wow yeah. so you don't use the sarah mclaughlin music anymore then no no <laughs> and i don't if you look at i've got a few videos on my channel where i'm talking about them you never even see the person you yeah. never i mean there's ways to do it tastefully but i kind of it's like a pendulum i swung one way so yeah. I, I had to swing like the other more now on the project and the solution it provides than yeah. anything else yeah. yeah i think i saw you tweet about um about these controllers the other day, right? Like you were talking about like doing some more of this. Did, did I see a tweet about that recently? Yeah, I was fantasizing about what it would take to do that full time. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly cost inefficient thing that I was doing. It took time, it took parts, and I was doing it for free. Mm. And if a company, you know, people say, why doesn't Microsoft or Sony or somebody do this and and the reason is so many people with these physical disabilities need an individualized solution they can't just pick up something off the shelf even an accessible controller won't work um, so many need it individualized that it has to be just I mean it, it cannot be done for profit yeah yeah because they can't afford it their insurance doesn't pay for it you know, it wouldn't make any sense. If I was charging an hourly rate, the controllers wouldn't be, I mean, they'd be hundreds of dollars and nobody would be sure. able to buy them. Yeah. It's pretty challenging too when you're trying to design for people like that. Um, I I got asked once to make a, it sounds simple, just basically like a little stool that this guy could put into his tub and yeah. he was paraplegic, had absolutely zero use of his legs, not even a little bit. And so... I did like the first iteration, just a mock-up, and I'm trying to test it out. Have you ever tried to turn off two of your limbs and get them to not just autonomically respond to a thing? You know, you're trying to like, okay, I don't have legs to use, and you just automatically put tension on a muscle or whatever. And I finally had to just hand it to the guy, go get into the tub, no water, let's see how this works out. You're going to be yeah. more buoyant in water, but I want to test it without Worst case scenario, you're in the tub, the water drained out, now you got to get out. Is this going to yeah. work? And it was like very eye-opening. So I can relate a little bit to what that must have been. You know, and you're dealing with electronics and more finite control and stuff too. So what a challenge. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I had to limit what I did. I had to throw my ego out the window and do mm. ugly things, simplest possible solutions. I mean, you know, when you shift your goals around and realize so much of what you're doing is serving your own ego, uh, at least for me, it was, um, you can get a whole lot more done, you know, if you're willing to scrap that. Right. 
and that, that leads me to a question I had is, um, what, what kind of advice or like what philosophy, like what kind of design philosophy would you want to share with others who, who might think like that they want to get in to this field, that they want to like work in accessibility? Like what is, it, what is your philosophy or your approach now that you've learned some lessons from your first attempt? Well, uh, the, the most important thing I can say, and, and this sounds like a no-brainer, but it's also probably the biggest problem I've run into. The most important thing is to actually sit down and talk with and have the person participate in the design process. Because we're all smart people, but we're also all kind of, since we create things, there's a little bit of egotism that, that I think we all have inherent you know, in, in ourselves that when we have an idea that we think will solve a problem, we feel passionately that that idea is the best idea. Yeah. And a lot of times people will tell you like with the controllers, you know, I, I would have this complex solution of something that I'd, it would take me hours to design and construct and they'd be like well could you just hot glue a popsicle stick on like at this <laughs> angle right here <laughs> oh that would help you yeah but that doesn't feel like i've accomplished <laughs> as much right right but it solves their problem mm -hmm. and and once you're able to kind of let go of that ego and and just let you know have them participate in the design process you can get so much more done and it's hard. It sounds easy, but it's hard. And I've had, I've met people even in, in this field who struggle with it and don't necessarily do it. Uh, but it's essential. You have to have, you, you cannot be an, an ally to people without their participation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Caleb Kraft, what's next for you now that maker media is done? No idea. No idea. Uh, How exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm so in love with the Maker Faire side of things and always have been. The magazine uh, is, it's great, but it's also print media, which, in, you know, my personal opinion is, is aging. Um, but and, and it was great to read the magazine, but Maker Fair just felt like it was life changing. It was life changing for me. It was life changing for so many people that I met. Uh, so um, I don't even know what to do after that, right? Like uh, I'm I'm taking a few a, a few weeks to just kind of sleep on it and and talk to everybody who wants to talk, um, and. Uh, I, I've had a few people kind of ping me with little, not full on job offers, but little things here and there. And I've, I've said to everybody, I'm just holding off and waiting. And then there's also a slight possibility that Maker Faire may pull through this after the reorganization. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the details of how all that is working, what Dale is doing exactly. But, you know, in the articles that are out, you can, you've seen quotes where he's saying that he's trying to acquire at least the Maker Faire licensing aspect in order to, to turn that into a nonprofit or a B Corp or something like that um, and keep Maker Faire uh, floating and maybe the magazine as well. Um, in which case, maybe I'll be right back working at Maker Faire again. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, you never know. In the, in the, like this week there's been, you know, there's been hundreds of hot takes about like where things went wrong and yeah. like why, why Maker Fair didn't succeed. And, and you were part of the organization for a long time. <laughs> it's not like looking back at like, like necessarily criticizing, but what do you, what do you see as like going forward? Like what would, what would like a future Maker Fair need to do to succeed in like today, today's era? Oh boy, that is a tough one. You know, I'm I'm not a great businessman. Uh, I'm not I'm not fantastic at judging what people will pay for. Uh, 
So for me to say what Maker Faire would need to do to become financially viable would be short-sighted. Um, so I can't really speak to that. However, what I can say is the, that, that Maker Faire is, the mini Maker Faires especially, are uh, economic boosters to the local, you know, the, the local areas that they're in. Uh, they work as, you know, community building. They work as outreach for uh, sponsor companies into the community to look for talent and to help foster goodwill in their local communities. I really see the, the mini maker fairs as being a valuable asset to the cities that they're in maybe more so than the one in San Francisco. Of course, that's also because I live in Missouri. So San Francisco seems like a, a you know, a strange beast with, with, you know, Facebook and, and all those big companies there that aren't maybe as necess necessarily interested in growing, you know, the small community outreach like you see in a lot of the other cities. Um, so what do they need to do? I think they need to focus on all the, the mini maker fairs. I mean, there were 200 last year. Yeah. There's so many and they're still they happening. Really well, the, the even one though, in, yeah, the one even here in North Carolina, the Burlington mini maker fair actually turned into North Carolina maker fair because the one in Raleigh stopped. Yeah. Probably yeah. There's a bit of that that happens there. there. Yeah. And it, it does really well for the community there every year. It's, it's a big draw. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess that makes sense because, I mean, ultimately, making is a very grassroots thing. Like, everyone in the community is making their own stuff. And so, I guess, maybe, like, like a grassroots approach is, like, the key to, to keeping these kind of events going. Like, totally. if, if you have the buy-in from your local community, like, you're going to have a hard time not succeeding, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can be tough. They can be... You know, our local one, uh, we have a, we really struggle to get participation in the city that I'm in. I don't run our local Maker Faire. I didn't, I really don't enjoy running events. So somebody else local handles it and I just show up every once in a while. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be really tough, not only getting sponsors to pay for the event, um, but also, you know, getting makers to come out of their workshops and yeah. show off their stuff. It can be tough, but it is rewarding and it is, it does build a community very quickly and, and a strong community at that. Yeah. Yeah. We have our, our local like weekly meetup group. Like we get like five people a week and like, I'm always like, come on, there's so many more people out here and I, we want to get them out and we get them out every now and then, but like, yeah, just keeping them excited to keep coming is yeah, that, that's, that takes some work and we're going to be starting hopefully, um, like a weekly, well, I don't know, we'll see. I, I have to talk to Roger about this some more, but we're going to try to do like a weekly bring a hack and do it at like a pizza place and get people to come out. Cause like, well, people will show up at least for food, right? <laughs> like, I hope. Yeah. yeah. Well, those are great though. That's a good way to start, you know, community building right there. Yeah. You're in LA. Yeah. Yeah. Elliot Phillips, who used to run Hackaday back in 2000, uh, six seven uh he used to run a weekly bring a hack oh yeah but i don't remember i don't know if he's still doing it he's working for like spacex now or something oh okay yeah as far as i know no i mean there's a handful of maker spaces out here but um none are out in like my geographic area and since since hackaday stopped doing their monthly like bring a hack things there hasn't really been anything else filling in so, um, I don't know. I try to keep it low key and just have people show up and eat pizza and like bring their, bring their toys for show and tell. I hope we'll see. That sounds like fun. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. fun in and of itself. <laughs> and you get to do it every week. So that's even better. You don't have to wait a year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hope so. We're, we're going to, we recently got a hold of, there was a, there was a defunct maker group, um, through meetup. And it hadn't, they hadn't had any meetings in like four or five years and the organizers on meetup stepped down. And so the group became available and I talked to Roger and I was like, dude, there's like 1500 people like in this group, like that's a lot of makers that like we can 
we can spam with our like our pizza meetups. <laughs> like, let's get a hold of this group. So we did. So we'll see how many we get. Okay. I hope that we don't have like 700 people show up because I can't handle <laughs> that. But we'll yeah. surprise overflow out of the out of the facility. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, we got about, um, uh, looks like about maybe five, six minutes left. Um, Caleb, real quick, anything uh, other than the engraving you were talking about? Any like projects you're working on around the house right now? Oh, boy. Uh, patched up my roof. I got a mid-century modern house with flat roof. And uh, uh, man, that's a nightmare. Yeah, I was right there always, with you about a month ago. <laughs> always got leaks somewhere. Yep. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, patching up my roof, fixing some drywall, uh, working on my van, my my '68 Dodge. Um, totally can... analog vehicle, aren't oh, that fun? <laughs> I know what I'm doing. I'm also, uh, you know, I've had I've had all these side projects for years that I kind of I let them kind of languish because it felt like there was a conflict between that and the make blog a little bit. Mm -hmm. But since I'm not doing the make blog, I've been writing every day on the oh, cool. uh, which is uh, focusing on animatronics, practical effects and cosplay. Ooh, neat. Awesome. I'm going to check so, that out. Just a little niche site. I mean, it's nothing fancy, but yeah. I can't help it. I got to, I got to, produce content constantly well yeah that's kind of how us types of folks is <laughs> yep. you just have to do something every day you can't just sit on your arse <clears throat> well cool well you know what you're gonna land on your feet because you never have been off your feet it sounds like you're just gonna be <laughs> right there and carry on yeah. which is great so well you know we'll see what happens with maker media i guess we'll i wish them well because um all of that has changed my life. So many other people too, you know, just the whole make thing and the maker movement. My wife and I met at a maker fair. I mean, I wouldn't be married and I wouldn't have found my oh, wow. wife if it wouldn't have been for a maker fair. So yeah, we, we met. Had a, we had a wedding at this last one. Yeah, I saw that. Oh, that yeah. was cool. That that's was really cool. cool. Yeah, that's great. Well, I hope there's another one next year and we'll all get to, say hey and raise a few beers together again yeah. uh, that was fun this year so i'm sure glad i went this was my first one this year and i'm glad i went because if there's never another one at least i got to see it once so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay awesome all righty do we have anything else dean i don't think we did right don't think so um i guess we can let people know how to follow us i'm on twitter uh at hack week and I'm on Twitter at MLE, the letters MLE underscore online. Uh, I'm on Twitter too, but I don't remember if it's Caleb Craft or Caleb underscore Craft. If you Google Caleb Craft, you, find it. Yeah. you will find me. <laughs> That's right. It's kind of what I tell people. Just like, just put my name into Google and <laughs> yeah. peruse through the five or six pages that come up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's what happens when you've been doing stuff on the internet for over a decade. It just gets right. that way. Internet famous. Oh boy. <laughs> all right. Well, and of course, YouTube channels. Um, we all have YouTube channels and same thing. You can just go hunt them down. You'll find them. I'm Hack -A Week TV. And, uh, and I'm Emily's Electric Oddities. Just Google me. Just Google Caleb, me. Caleb is yeah. just Caleb Kraft. <laughs> right. I use my real name everywhere. Real name. That's everywhere. Cool. If, you, yeah. if you Google me, you'll find like forum threads from, you know, when forums began existing. Yeah, right. Uh, like I've, I've always used my real name everywhere. Back when the only thing they were for was to argue with each other. The good yeah. old days. <laughs> yeah. I think at one point, at one point in the early days, like I'm going to say late 90s, I used C4L3B for a very short period of time. Okay. But ever since then... My real, my full name, my real name, everywhere. That's that also keeps me from being an asshole. It's easier. Yeah, that's true, right? You're not hiding behind some fake name. It's This is me. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Caleb, thanks for being on uh, the podcast. Loved it. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Anytime. Yeah, so, big fan. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing what comes next for you. Thanks. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> More than us, I'm sure. Do so you want to take us out with the keep on hacking slogan? 
Till next time. Till next time. Keep on acting. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.